Hey, good morning. Good morning. Oh, I wanted to keep singing. But I got a, I got a, a real good message and I want to get going. And uh, so we worship God with our, uh, with music and we worship God with the word and we worship God sometimes with just how we look at people and greet them and, and how we act. Which leads me to this topic. Um, take me down just slightly. Which leads me to this topic. It's kind of a hot topic, so if you guys are taking notes, got your iPads or iPhones or... Remember pen and paper? Remember that? <laughs> you can use that too. So um, I'm not trying to step on people's toes or anything, but there's something I've been noticing lately, and I really believe God wants me to talk about this, so here we go. Um, we think about how we can have this deeper relationship with God and become better examples of Jesus. And we've been talking a lot about that since we've opened. Um, and I think, is it a week after? We've been here officially 10 months or 11? 10? 10. And we keep consistently talking and, and focusing on Jesus and being examples of God and loving people. But lately, if you guys are watching the news and, you know, whatever channels you watch... You know, CBS, CNN, Fox, MSN, Nickelodeon, you know, whatever, whatever news you guys watch. Um, if you listen, and if you listen to what's happening with, with, uh, with people and groups calling Christians uh, certain things and names, and there is a word that's used right now by people that may not have a relationship with Jesus that they're using to describe Christians. And it's even a word that, um, that Christians, unfortunately, will call other Christians when we look at them and we're kind of disappointed in their actions or they're not acting the way we think they should be acting. And the word is? Hypocrite. hypocrite. Wow, you guys are on it. <laughs> hypocrite. Right. So Christians every day are increasingly being called out and called Christians. Uh, Christians are being called uh, hypocrites. And we're called, you know, haters, and we're not practicing what we preach. Um, groups say that, you know, you Christians, you guys preach about love, and you preach about, you know, loving everybody, but yet you, you disagree with so many groups. You disagree with so many people and things that are going on in the world, and we don't understand that. Therefore, since you don't accept everything, you guys are hypocrites. hypocrites. I love going to the Webster's Dictionary. I'm going to give you this definition. The definition of, hip, of hypocrite, it's, it's a noun, person, place, or thing, although sometimes it can be used as an adjective for all of you English majors. Um, a person who puts on a false appearance of virtue or religion. A person who acts in contradiction to his or her stated beliefs or feelings. A person who claims or pretends to have certain beliefs about what is right, but behaves in a way that disagrees with those beliefs. That pretty good? That's what your understanding is? Hypocrite? Yeah. But pay attention to the word pretends. Okay? Pretends. That's a big word. The biblical definition and the original meaning of hypocrite... This comes from the Greek word hypocritai. I just learned that. And means stage actors, right? Someone who's acting, playing a role, being phony. Remember that word pretend, right? Then once nobody was watching them, they go back to being who they really are, their true selves. So if you really look at the word hypocrite and you focus on the words pretend and role play and, you know, phony, Let's go right to what Jesus said. We read why Jesus talks about hypocrites and who he was talking to, and who he was referring to, and how he was using the word hypocrite. When Jesus was teaching and ministering to people, he had a few confrontations. That's one thing I just love about Jesus. You know, everybody looks at Jesus and he was very loving. He was very sweet and kind and gentle, but Jesus had some righteous anger. Jesus raised his voice on occasion. Jesus definitely believed and knew what he was saying was truth. And he wasn't afraid to let people know that. I love that. So, Jesus is talking to these religious leaders, these Pharisees. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Jesus was challenging them, these religious leaders. See, Jesus knew the scriptures. And he made sure that, um, that the people that were preaching the word, whether or not they were really holding true to the word or not. He called some of these Pharisees hypocrites. See, because they knew the scripture too. They knew God's word. 
and they made sure that they followed every single detail everything they got up at this time and they ate this stuff and they prayed at this time and they treated people exactly this way exactly to the letter of the law the issue was they didn't put themselves to those same standards they thought themselves as above everybody else they were pretending and purposely acting above everybody else they puffed themselves up they didn't have care and compassion for the people that needed love and mercy and forgiveness the hungry the poor the sick the ones that were overwhelmed by life's issues the ones that are just getting beat up so much by life they were just giving up the Pharisees would walk around and demand respect for being so holy and better than everybody else and righteous so let's be clear regarding Jesus' definition of hypocrite. Matthew 23, 1, 28. I'm going to skip around on here. I'm going to hit the, the main points. Verse 1. Then Jesus said to the crowd and his disciples, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees and the official interpreters of the law of Moses. So he's telling the people, all right, see these Pharisees? Practice and obey whatever they tell you because they're reading the Word of God. But don't follow their example for they don't practice what they teach. They crush people with unbearable religious constraints and demands and never lift a finger to ease their burden. Verse 5, everything they do is for show. Verse 13, what sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites. For you shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces and you won't go in yourselves and you don't let the others enter either. Verse 23, what sorrow awaits you, you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are careful to tithe. That's giving money to support God's house financially. Even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith a couple more here 28 outwardly you look like righteous people but inwardly your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness see Jesus was calling them out for being two-faced for knowing the Word of God and purposely as hypocrites purposely puffing themselves up and making it all about them rather than all about God not giving mercy to people, not loving people who really needed help, not having this real compassion, this real mercy and grace for people that are in trouble. They use God's laws for their own purpose. So yes, in the large group of followers of Christ and being human and with sin and messing up, are there people who know better and use the word of God to make themselves look good? Yeah. To consciously take glory from God for their own gain. This is why Jesus was calling some of the religious leaders hypocrites. See, but Jesus was focusing on these people that purposely pretend and with an intent to play act or put themselves in this visible place in front of people to puff themselves up and to be something that they really are not. So the thing is, what is everybody talking about nowadays? They're calling us Christians as a whole. They're calling us hypocrites. All of us, because we believe in the true word of God. So are all Christians hypocrites? Some people think so. I'm not going to advertise this site, but it's pretty scary if you look at it. There's this website that's anti-Christian. I'm not going to tell you what the name of it is. And the sole purpose of this website is to tell Christians and others just how how much, and I'm trying to use kinder words, how much full of it we are <laughs> because we say one thing and do another. I'm going to read you. This is the title of the very first paragraph. And I think this is pretty much what we hear every day. Christians are hypocrites. They love to talk about how loving, dutiful, and compassionate they are. Yet I have yet to meet one who does not practice hypocrisy to the highest degree. Their willful ignorance of the Bible combined with their two-faced idealism, idealism to preach it has made us sick 
hasn't it? For nearly 2,000 years, biblicists have been lecturing people on the importance of adhering and staying to the Bible's teachings regarding ethics and manners and morality. They quote Jesus and Paul profusely with the liberal sprinkling of Old Testament morality. The problem with their approach lies not only in an often note failure to practice what they preach, their hypocrisy is so rampant that even the validity of calling themselves Christian is in question. I yeah, know, pretty tough, huh? Man. Well, I got something to say. So, is this fair or accurate? No, no, not really. See, this person is holding up all Christians to something that's impossible. Perfection. And God knows this. He knows it. See, the person who wrote this article, for the people who don't have a relationship with God yet, or even the ones that maybe have accepted Jesus recently and they're just learning, but especially for the ones that are purposely standing against God, here is the Bible verse that they either don't know or they don't take into consideration when judging the group of true Christian believers who love God and accept Jesus as Savior. Here's the Bible verse that they are not thinking about. They don't care about. Here's your highlight. Romans 3, 21, 26. Listen carefully. For now God has shown us a way to be made right with Him without keeping the requirements of the law. In other words, there's no way we can keep every law. As was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone has sinned and fall short of the glory of God, his standard. Yet God freely and graciously declares that we are righteous despite of that. We did this through Christ Jesus who freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for our sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. Listen. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness. For he himself is fair and just. And he declares sinners to be right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. In other words, hey, we don't do it on our own. We'll mess up. Anybody mess up? Me. Every day. Every day. You know, we try our best. We really do. And if we fall, if we make a mistake, are we hypocrites? No. That's not the definition. That's not Webster's dictionary, and that's definitely not Jesus' definition of hypocrite. See, God knows perfection is impossible. That's why He gives us mercy and grace and forgiveness and redemption and an acceptance despite our faults. That's why Jesus went to the cross. He took it all upon Himself. Like that bumper sticker, sticker says, yeah, Christians are not perfect. They're just forgiven. forgiven. If people are really not sorry for their sins, not really repenting or asking for forgiveness, they try to manipulate the Word of God for their own glory, to puff themselves up, to put on a show, to pretend, then Jesus calls those people hypocrites, like some of the Pharisees at that time. Followers of Jesus who fail to perfectly live up to the Word of God and have fallen at times are not hypocrites. No Christian has ever been perfect and no one will ever be perfect. Someone who tries to make a mistake, someone who's trying really hard but makes a mistake and blows it once in a while and then gets back up and tries again is not a hypocrite. That is not what Jesus meant. Listen to this part. Jesus did not call his disciples hypocrites. He called them my followers, my sheep, my church. He called them my beloved. Okay, at the beginning of the message, we gave the definitions of the word hypocrite. 
the definition of hypocrite is not I have to read this someone who does their best and occasionally makes a mistake or a bad judgment call or hasn't learned everything possible yet gets back up and does his or her best to do better the next time while earnestly trying to become a better person according to the word of God yes. that's right. yet that's what the world thinks a hypocrite is here's to the point if I haven't been to the point yet yeah. <laughs> Most Christians who are sincerely trying to please God and live according to His Word allow God to teach and direct. Amen. And we believe in all of God's Word or we believe in none of it. It's true from the first word to the last, whether people think so or not. God's, validity, God's uh, Word, His validity does not depend on what we believe. And when, not if we mess up, that doesn't mean that God's word is not true. It doesn't mean that what we believe in isn't true. See, the Holy Spirit will let us know. We don't need to let people tell us when we mess up. We know it. Holy Spirit convicts us. We feel in our spirits that we've messed up. And then God gives us the strength to change and grow and improve and reduce as much as possible the chances of us messing up again. And though we try our best, despite our mess-ups, our mistakes, our sins, and being imperfect human beings, we learn Romans 5.8. But God demonstrates His own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus has that kind of love for you. And it's really hard for people nowadays to see it. Jesus is misrepresented. Somehow he's not cool enough or not relevant enough. Or we get most of what we learn from Jesus from news and media. So those people that say, well, if God is so forgiving while you were yet sinners, then why don't you guys just live the way you want? Do what you want. Treat people the way you want. Do whatever it is that makes you feel good. Because if you go to God and you ask for forgiveness, He's going to forgive you anyway, right? Is there a warning? Oh, yeah. See, here's the thing. For those of us that are striving to learn who God is, we should know that God knows your heart. That's right. That's right. He knows your motivations, your intentions. God is not deceived. He wasn't born yesterday. <laughs> we can never manipulate, it just came to me, or put one over on God and get away with fooling Him ever. Sometimes we go in secret and we do things that like nobody's looking. Yeah. It doesn't work that way. It's like nowadays, people at work, you know, they may uh, take something home from work or something, they get caught, and usually because what's watching them? The, cam the video cameras, right? <laughs> so just picture God kind of like <laughs> this video camera everywhere you go. But it's a good thing. Because the reason why is because God's watching us. He cares about us. He loves us. He wants to make sure we're okay. He's there not to be this controlling. He's there to say, do you need me? I'm right here. I never leave you. I never forsake you. Please don't walk away from me. See, I told the story before, I think. We've been here almost a year, so I may repeat a story or two. This is relevant. I knew this girl in high school. The sweetest, just prettiest little thing. She was so sweet. And I, I dated her when um, she was in the ninth grade. I was in the eleventh grade. Just really kind and her her dad was a was a minister really nice girl we dated for a while but after high school we we lost touch with each other and I hadn't seen her for a couple of years um, I, I was in college I was walking you know through the campus on my way to like lunch or cafeteria or something and I saw her I went wow wow um, hey girl not to be named uh, how are you doing <laughs> And, and we sat down for a while and we started talking, catching up. She was telling me she was in this relationship. And she was a little different. And I was at a point in my life where I was kind of hitting a stride. I was doing well with my relationship with God. I was, I was doing better than most times. And she was telling me, um, 
she was talking about this relationship that she was in and how the relationship had turned sexual. And I kind of looked at her and said, is that really a good idea? You know, um, we were just talking and, and I was trying to tell her that may not be a good idea right now because we know better. Because we were in high school, we used to go to Bible studies together. And I was trying to hold her up to what the Word of God said. And she looked at me and she says, well, you know what? I know what's wrong. But we really like it. And doesn't God have to forgive me anyway? Luke 16, 15 through 18. Jesus talking to the Pharisees again. Then he said to them, You like to appear righteous in public, but God knows your hearts. What this world honors is detestable in the sight of God. Clear cut. Now look. I've been very upfront since we started. We're human. We're going to mess up. None of us are where we need to be right now. None of us, including me. So if you're going through some stuff and you're not yet where God wants you to be, you know what God really wants? He wants you just to be on the right track. Amen. He wants you to wake up every day and say, God, I want to be better today than I was yesterday. And when I wake up tomorrow, I want to be better tomorrow than I am today. God wants you to continually strive to be holy, to please Him. So how do we not become these hypocrites? The ones that are phony and pretend. The ones that call us hypocrites. How do they see us differently? Well, I got a few things for you. In God's Word. Number one, know what God is saying to you. Know the truth. John 8, 31 to 32. Jesus said to the people who believed in Him, You are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. And you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Amen. See, a couple things. Read God's Word. Learn it. Recognize God's plan for you. And as you grow, not become perfect, but as you grow, take a stand and say, now I know better. And it's time to back up my words. Number two, work on yourself and let God work on the other person. This is a big one for us Christians. Don't have to raise your hand, just kind of spiritually raise your hand. <laughs> Matthew 7, 3 through 5. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log that's in your own eye? Hypocrite. First get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. See, here's the thing, bluntly. Stop, trying to try, stop trying to change everybody else. Let God work on the other people, and your priority should be to let God work on you. As you run the risk of being a hypocrite, when you fail to deal with your own issues. Now, in our life, that's my wife. There was years that we were married. And I was not the guy I was supposed to be. The first, I'd say like from 16 to 18, I'm doing pretty good. You know, 18 to like 25, I take a dip. And then we get married. And I'm just, I'm in this wave of in God's plan and out of God's plan. She tried for years to change me. She prayed. She goes, oh, and she challenged me. And she, she would tell me, Al, Al, you're, she calls me Al. Um, you're better than this. I didn't listen to her. And then something happened. She, um, she left me alone. She stopped talking to me in, you know, ways of trying to change me. She started telling me, um, I'm going to church. See you later. And she'd walk out. I'd see her pray. I'd see her be different. She was stronger, yet gentle. She was challenging me without condemning me. I saw that. And what she did was right. She let me go. 
She said, God, he's yours. And she worked on herself. That is what changed me. Number three, don't beat yourself up. Don't beat yourself up if you fall, if you mess up. We do that way too much. We're too hard on ourselves. Lamentations 3, 22 to 23. The faithful love of the Lord never ends and His mercies never cease. Great is His faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh every morning. Yes. And I didn't see that before, but we connected with that song. It's so cool. If we fall, ask God for forgiveness and mean it. His mercies begin afresh every single morning. Get back up and try your best again. That means yesterday's sins can be forgiven and forgotten, and you have a fresh start if you need one. If you generally wake up in the morning and say, God, today's your day. I'm going to wake up in a God mood. Number four, be the same in the dark as you are in the light. Psalm 139, 12. 139.12 To you, the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. See, God is the same. Day or night. We need to strive for that. See, God stays that exact same. We need to be consistent. We need to try to walk with God every moment of the day, every night. Whether we're alone with other people, why should we change who we are and how we act just because we're around our coworkers or some friends or people who may not know the Lord, but we want to fit in and we don't want to intimidate them. So suddenly we start acting a different way. We start talking a different way. The whole coworker thing gets me sometimes because um, it's on camera, so I got to be careful. I had this great experience. I saw... Not a prideful moment for me, but I saw a very proud moment for God's people last week. See, there was a time where I worked for a company, not the one I do now, but the one I worked for a company, and boy, they influenced me so bad. My lifestyle was ridiculous. I don't even want to repeat. Just horrible. I let all these people influence me. I was so weak, and I knew better. I knew better. So I went to this company picnic this last week. I went to this company picnic and this friend of mine who's a pastor at a church in Sacramento comes up to me and says, hey, I, I wanted to talk to you. I saw him at a training last month and we connected. So we start talking and we're out in this park and there's like, you know, 80 people or whatever and we're having a barbecue and everybody's, you know, talking about work and whatever. And he says an elder in our church last week went to Minnesota to a conference and at the conference had a major heart attack. He's only 42. He's in a coma. The doctors say that there's no brain activity. He's got six kids ranging from 3 to 13. God bless the mom. And she has to fly out there to tell the doctors, pull the plug. But she's not going to. He says, can you pray? I said, oh man, absolutely. So we got off the, this, this grass area that we were in. We went and stood in the shade. And I saw this friend of mine that I knew was a fellow believer. I go, oh, I, I need two or more to pray for this man for healing. So I, I ran over and she was talking to my boss. I said, excuse me, you know, I'm sorry to interrupt you guys. But can you come pray with us? Not my boss, but to the person I knew. And she goes, yeah, sure. So we ran over, and it was, I was walking back to the tree under the shade where we were going to pray, and I saw somebody else that I knew that I used to work with before in a different apartment, and I, I ran over and got her. I said, can you pray with us? And I saw somebody else, and we ran and got them. And then we stood around, about six or seven of us, and we held hands and we started praying loud. <laughs> And I closed my eyes, and when I looked up, there was more people than when we started. I pray for that man. His name is Paul. I don't know what's happening yet. I haven't got an update, but I pray for his healing. And the reason why I tell you that is because that wasn't me 15, 20 years ago. I never would have done that. 
And it's not about me. It's about God in us. So be the same in the dark as you are in the light. Don't change when you're around other people. You know, one other quick thing. I'm going to close with this. Um, Most of you know that I used to play in clubs and bars and nightclubs uh, when I lived in Hawaii and even in L.A. And um, um, I was all about that lifestyle. Everything that goes with it. I just... uh, I'm just thanking God I'm not the same person. Okay? So don't beat yourself up. If you make a mistake, just get back up. Give it up to God and try again. So I'm going to close with this. The point of this message is not to highlight that we know better, but we still make mistakes anyway. The highlight here is that the highlight here is the love that God has for everyone, no matter where you are right now. And for those of you that do not yet have a relationship with Jesus, know this. We strive to live for God and do our best. And we're not hypocrites. If we fall or come up short, God loves us anyway and is rooting for us to succeed in life with Christ despite our mess-ups. Because what we're striving for is a deeper relationship with God. And like I said at the beginning, we want to become even better examples of Jesus and his love for people. So, you guys got the definition, right? Those that know better and pretend and willfully know that they're not following God? Hypocrites. The ones that are God's sheep, his followers, his beloved. So, what do we do? If people still call us hypocrites. Romans 12, 9 through 14. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. And love each other with genuine affection. And take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality and bless those who persecute you. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father God, how awesome you are. You rock, Lord. You love us no matter where we come from, no matter what we did, no matter who we were. You love us no matter what, God. Thank you for forgiving us when we fall, Lord, and for picking us back up and dusting us off and keeping us going, Lord. When we need strength, you give us strength. When we need hope, you give us hope. When we need mercy, you give us mercy, Lord. And when we need correction, you give us discipline. I thank you, Lord, for everybody that's here right now, that we can go out and love the people that persecute us. That we can show them not just who we are, Lord, but we can show them who you are. And I thank you for that, Lord. And I just give you praise and glory. And God's sheep, his followers, his beloved say, Amen. 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 Pastor Rick.